All right. Good morning and welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us here this morning on um, a beautiful, sunny Sunday morning, a time and an opportunity to worship and to gather together with one another to um, give praise, honor, and glory to the King, but also to maybe build one another up to help one another to grow in our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, I just want to say thank you um, for your continued faithful giving um, in this season. I know it's not always easy, but I know many of you have found the online giving platform. Many of you would continue to mail in your checks and it's continued to allow us to operate and put forth the gospel um, on a week-by-week basis. So I just thank you for your continued faithfulness there. Um, I also just wanted to bring clarity. Um, it was brought to my attention last week during communion um, leading up to that time frame um, that there was a concern that I had made a statement on my announcement that there was nothing special about having communion together as a family. And what I meant by that, or as the church, and what I meant by that is that you know there's nothing special about we can only do it on Sunday mornings, the fourth Sunday of the month. But that more importantly, what we need to realize is that we can do that in our families as brothers and sisters. We can do that in our small group Bible studies as we gather in the future, right? We can have communion in those times as well because we're gathering with one another. And the Bible says that whenever we come together and when we do this with one another, do it in remembrance of him. So I didn't mean it that it wasn't special. I didn't mean that it wasn't important to the church service at all. What I meant is that it's not about just here gathered at Hope Fellowship. We can do that in amongst our worship um, of the King on a day-by-day basis. So I just wanted to bring clarity to that um, in case there was any misunderstanding going forward. Um, with that, let's go ahead and pray real quick before we get into worship. Um, I just sense that we need to pray before we go, so let's, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for today. Um, I thank you for the opportunity, Lord. I thank you for bringing us all together in this place, um, <laughs> in this place of many places, in our, in our homes, God, to desire to worship you. I pray that you would speak to each one of us, and, we, and this is the awesome thing about how your work You are omnipresent. You are everywhere, God. There's nowhere we can go without you. So you are present in each one of our homes. You're present in this church building. Um, So Lord, would you you continue to speak to us? Would you draw us in um, to a greater love of you? Um, Realizing that you are our good father. Realizing that you are one who loves us and who prays for us and provides for us um, everything that we need. And so Lord, we just lift up our voices. Um, We lift up our hearts to you, God, um, that you would be made much of. Um, Not just today, but every day this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. 
Your strong tower, your safety. He doesn't see you as broken. He doesn't see you as worthless. There's parts of your life that maybe feel broken or you don't know who you are or where you're going. He knows. He knows those parts. It says in Psalms that he knit you together in your mother's womb and before there's even a thought in your mind, he knows it. knows where you're going to sit, where you're going to stand. He goes before you and behind you. He surrounds you. He knows every hair on your head. And someone who knows you so intimately is not going to leave you. He's not going to leave you. This is truth. It's something that I know at my core. He's not going to leave you. Just rest in that today, that promise. Hey, I'm just going to stay still. I know, I know, I know that you're not going to leave me. I know, I know that you're not going to your heart but he's not gonna leave you we're just gonna sit in this for just a minute more i know that you're not gonna leave me i know that you're not gonna leave me no matter how broken i feel no matter how dirty i feel i know that you're not gonna before we start this song. Galatians 4, um, 4 through 7, this is in the message. It says, but when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent a son born among us as a, of us, a woman born under the conditions of the law, so that he might redeem those of us who had been kidnapped by it. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children. 
because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives, crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave but a child? And if you are a child, you are also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. And I just want to read it also out of the Passion Translation. Let me find it here. It says, Yet all this was so that he would redeem us and set us free all those held hostage to the written law so that he we would receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his children and so that we would know for sure that we are his true children god released the spirit of his sonship into our hearts moving us to cry out intimately my father you are my true father you are more real than Too far. 
Like a father you are, like a daddy you are, I get to call you Abba, I get to call you Abba, like a father you are, like a daddy you are, I get to call you Abba, I get to call you Abba, we come as children. Thank you for reminding us. Thank you for reminding us that you are our father, that you are our daddy. That that term Abba in Hebrew is the most tender term for father. It's the most intimate term. It's what the little children would say as they run up to their dad. It's something we all know and all long for, and you've given it to us. You've given us the spirit within us that cries out, Papa. Cries out, Daddy. Cries out, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Father, that you are the one who pulls us close, pulls us close inside of your arms and defends us, shields us.
speaks truth over us when we don't know who we are, when our minds are crushed with anxiety and fear, when our identity seems taken. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we're going. Father, you pull us close like a child, and you remind us that we're yours that we're your son, that we're your daughter, that you have put a ring on our finger, that you have put a robe upon our back and you've declared us yours. Yours. This one is mine. This one is mine. And it pleases you, Father. It pleases you to do this. You desire that we would walk in sonship, daughter, that we would know that we're your daughters. That we don't have to fear that our Father is the King of Heaven, the Creator of the universe, and He knows every part of me, so what do I have to fear? He knows my frame very well because He made it. He's not going to give me more than I can bear, and when it feels like I can't bear it, I can come to Him. Thank you, Father. Thank you that this is who you are. Thank you for reminding us this morning of who you are, that you are good and your goodness runs after us. goodness runs after us. You are our Father. I pray that throughout this week we wouldn't forget it. We wouldn't forget you, Father. But we would just come to you. That We would get to know you again. Maybe for some of us it's been a long time since we've come to our Father. We've come to Jesus, or we've come to the Holy Spirit, or we've come to God, the creator of the world, but if Father seems unapproachable, when really Father is sitting there, arms open, just saying, crawl up. Crawl up into my lap. I'm right here. Come. Come cry with me. Come let me hold you. Let me wash your worries away. Let me clothe you in righteousness. Let me take off all those dirty things and put you and make you holy and spotless with my tender arms that are strong enough to hold you. He's strong enough to hold you. He's strong enough to hold you. Your emotions don't scare him. Your thoughts don't scare him and they don't offend him. He wants to work it out with you. You have a father who wants to work it out with you. He doesn't just boot you out and tell you to figure it out. He doesn't leave you on your own. Fathers, he loves you. He's right there. Thank you, Father. We love you. How we love you. In your name, amen. Thank you, worship team, for the reminder. Um, as we were going through, love came down. And we're to remind ourselves, right, of all that he's done. And as we think about, as we were singing today, and I'm thinking about the message that I'm going into, I think that's a, a proper entry point to launch off of. Because um, we're going to get into a topic today that is prevalent in our world today. Um, unfortunately, I think we as fathers, as parents, we've propagated it in our kids. Um, and, and we create it in our kids to make it more difficult for our kids at times. Um, as, we were just, as we were singing the last song, I'm sitting there going, you know, it's one of those things that I think, you know, from a, from a father's perspective, right, we have the opportunity to look at our kids and ask for forgiveness for the times that we've created this in them and made it difficult for them to trust their Heavenly Father, to make it difficult for them to draw close and to trust that He was going to provide and, and give everything that He is and that He's, He is the defender of their hearts and at the same time, right, as a, as, a, as a son, right, that I would be able to look at my own father, right, in those times maybe that's made it difficult for me and say, you know what, I forgive you, right, and that, you know what, this isn't something that um, I hold against you, right, yes, it's made it difficult for me, yes, it's maybe created 
um, some worry in my heart and, my anxi- and anxiety in my heart toward the things of God and is he capable and will he do the things he says he's going to do. But um, it was a good reminder for us that God is able, right? that he is willing and that he does desire to walk with us and to see us through it all. And so that's the topic we're going to look into. That's the respectable sin that we're going to look at this morning is that of anxiety and worry. Um, and I know for many, maybe you look at it and go, you know what, anxious, that's just part of who I am. I'm just an anxious person. Right? And then I get that to a degree, but it's not really true. Right? Anxiety shows something deeper in our hearts and in our minds and in our understanding of who God is. Um, and really what it starts to show is it starts to show a lack of um, disbelief a lack of trust that God is able, that God is, you know, a loving father, that God is a good father, that everything he says he'll do, he'll do. Right? And it's absolutely true. His scripture says, right, that these are the things that he's done for us, and if he's done these things, he will continue to do those things for you and I. Um, I just look at it from a personal perspective. When I look at my own life, and, you know, there's times in my life that I've battled through anxiety. There's things that I've battled through with worry in different situations, and Yet now as we look backwards, and I'm probably not alone in this, that as we look backwards, we saw God's hand in the midst of that, and we start to realize that there really wasn't a need to be anxious. There wasn't a need to have all this worry in my life um, as we go forward. And now that as God has asked us as a family and as an individual for myself to take different steps of faith, I look at him and go, sure, let's jump. And it's become easier. Right? I'm not by any means through it at all. Right? There's still times of anxiety that rise up in me and, and worry that rise, that rise up in my own life. And I'm like, God, I don't know if I really trust you. Right? But that's what I'm always brought back to is, God, do I really trust you? Right? If this is what you're asking me to do, if this is what you're telling me to do in Scripture, if these are the things that you're saying, do I really trust you? Right? And then I go back and as I, as I prayed this morning with the worship team and I think, of the, I think it's the guy with the paralytic and he's coming to Jesus and he goes, if you're willing, and Jesus says, well, I'm willing, and he goes, help my unbelief. And I think we all have those situations in our lives, those areas in our lives where we have unbelief, where we don't really trust God fully. And I, and I encourage you to, to see it and to acknowledge it for what it is. Because in our day and age, right, it seems like worry is a modern pastime. It's just something that we do. I can't tell you how many people I talk to, and I myself probably over the course of times, that people worry about not having money. They worry about their car breaking down. Right? I only have one car. If it breaks down, whatever will I do? I just I, I don't know what I would do if it did. Right? If you're in school, you're worried about your grades, or will I get into the right university, or will I pick the right job, or if you're on the verge of maybe in that late stage of life where you're looking at maybe looking for a spouse, will I pick the right spouse? God, do you have somebody for me? And maybe you're worried about the economy. Maybe you're worried about your job. Maybe you're worried about your health. It's, I mean, it's endless, <laughs> the opportunities. And in our world today, it's really endless. You don't have to listen to the media very long for there to be all kinds of anxiety and worry as they continue to propagate fear. Right? It continues to push us down this path of, 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 of being anxious and, and being worried that, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? And I think the whole time we forget that there's one who's in control and none of this comes as a surprise to him. He's fully aware of what's going on in our world. He's fully aware of what's going on in my life and he's fully aware of what's going on in your life. And he has not left you. He's not forsaken you. That he's walking alongside of you and he wants you to know that he's there with you and wants you to know that he's got it in control and he's got the provision necessary to go forward and to go through whatever it is you want. Or whatever it is you're going through, not even what you want. What it is you're going through, whatever it is you're struggling with. And when we look at this word worry or anxiety, right, it means to be concerned about something. It means to have a care or a concern. It means to be sidetracked down a different path. Things we don't understand, right? We, we start to have a concern and we start to see ourselves sidetracked to go somewhere else. It generally refers to an unhealthy and unproductive concern. Right, it's unproductive. It, it doesn't really do anything. And I can only look in things in my past that I've been anxiety about or I'd worry about, and I'm like, was it really within my control? <laughs> if it's not within my control, why am I worrying about it so much? Can I do anything about it? And in and, and most of the situations that are there, there's, like, there's nothing I could do. And that's probably similar for you, right? There's so many things as you, as you take maybe some time this week and you process this and you, you look in your own heart and in your own mind and you go, what things have I been anxious about? What things am I worrying about? What things am I being fearful of? You'll probably find that there's many of them that 
They're way beyond your control. And God's just asking you and I to go, will you trust me? Do you believe that I got this? Do you believe I'm in control? Do you believe that I'm a loving father who's in control and is caring for you? This idea of anxiety and worry is brought out in various ways throughout Scripture. You could look in Matthew 10. I'm just going to ask you to write these down. Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus said to the, his apostles, right, he's sending them out before the authorities and he's concerned about, about the persecution that's going to come. And he says, do not worry about how or what you are to say. For it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. And I look at this just even from an aspect of evangelism, because that's where this verse, I believe, so often in our day is used, because we're so concerned that when we leave the church, when we go out of this place and we go out to the, you know, to the world or to our family members or to our coworkers, we're concerned, what will I say? Will I say the right things? I don't want to screw it up. I, and we're all concerned and we're all worried. We got ourselves so worked up that when the time comes, we, it, we, we stutter. We don't, it's like, stop. Don't worry about that. All I'm asking you to do is to go and to be faithful to go. When you go, I will give you what you need. The question is, is do we believe that? The question is, do we trust that? I think so often we would rather him go, God, give me exactly what I need to say, then I'll go. Does that require faith? If God gives us exactly what we need and he says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this, and that's not unseen. Faith is being certain of what we don't see. And so he asks us, he says, go and witness. And he goes, well, what am I going to say? He goes, well, I'll tell you what to say when you get there. I think that's a great, one of the great challenges in the church today, every evangelism. We want to know everything up front. And he goes, I've given you resources galore. Will you just go and not worry about what to say? I'll give it to you when you need it. Then you can look at the story of Martha and Mary. Right, Jesus is coming to visit and Martha gets upset with Mary because she's not helping with the preparation. And I know there's a lot of Marys and there's a lot of Marthas in our world, and I think we need a balance of that in our lives personally, right? We need to have Martha. We need to be prepared. We need to be diligent. We need to be resourceful. We need to be working, right? But at the same time, that needs to be balanced and offset with the reality that we need to be Mary in our lives too that needs to sit and to realize that the most important thing is that we're spending time with Christ that we're spending time with the Creator, that we're spending time with God the Father. But he tells Martha, Jesus is, this is Jesus' reply to Martha. Right? He hears this going on, and she even goes to him and says, why don't you tell her to get to work? Why don't you do it, God? Right? And he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. That's found in Luke chapter 10. Verses 40 through 42, basically in a paraphrase, he says, Martha, you're too distracted by food preparation. You're too distracted by the things of this world, and you're missing what I'm doing right in front of you. And I think that happens in our lives. We get so anxious about all these other things, and we get that anxiety and that worry and that fear pushes out the voice of God in our lives, and we, and we miss what he's saying to us a lot of times because we're so fearful. And we're so anxiety, full of anxiety. And then we think about it even in practical world manners. Paul doesn't leave it just to the spiritual. He doesn't leave it just to these things that are out there about things, about, you know, spiritual matters. He brings it to real life matters. If you were to go into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 34, and he starts to talk about marriage, and Paul goes, I'd really rather you not be married because those who aren't married, they're concerned with the things of God. But those who are married are about concerned about the things of the world, right? They're concerned and they have a rightful need to be concerned about fulfilling one's desires and role as a mate, as a husband, as a wife. Right? They get sidetracked a little bit. And anybody who's married right, understands that right, there's times that you'd love to just be completely devoted to one or the other. And it doesn't work that way all the time. Right? There's real world things that have to be taken place when you start, to, when you start a family. Right, there's anxieties that rise up. There's sidetracks that go down and, and take our attention away from being devoted fully to God, potentially. And we have to be careful about that. Right? We have to be concerned about those worries that are there. The concern about worry and anxiety, though, is it's generally viewed negatively. It's not a good thing. <laughs> right? In Scripture, worry and anxiety is not healthy. Jesus, in the parable of the sower, in the parable of the soil, he takes that third soil and he says that it's going to be choked out by what? 
He goes, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew 13, 22. Right? He's concerned right, when the seed comes in, it's going to land in this soil, and the, the worries of the world, the concerns of the flesh, the concerns of the real world are going to choke it out. And it happens in way too many people. I think it happens in our own lives at different times throughout life. Right? The concerns of this world choke out our desire for God. They choke out our ability to spiritually mature. They start to give us down a different path. And we start, before we know it, right, we're so concerned about our job or we're con- so concerned about our home or we're so concerned about our hobby or we're so concerned about fill in the blank. And before we know it, the last time that we've interacted with our hev- loving Heavenly Father was a week ago two weeks ago, a month ago. And he goes, that shouldn't be the case. That that shouldn't be the way it is. You shouldn't be so concerned about those things. Right? It makes our lives unfruitful. It makes our lives that we're in, in a way that we don't mature. Right? It brings no fruit to maturity. And so the question is, is does that describe you and me? Right? Do the worries of this world bring unfruitfulness in your spiritual life? Is there areas in your spiritual life that God is asking you to deal with, that God is working in your life, and you're going, God, when I have time, I'll worry about that. Right? When I have time, I'll get to that. But in the meantime, I've got these more pressing matters over here that need to be addressed. That's a scary spot. But that's a question I think we have to honestly answer for ourselves. Right? Do these worries and anxieties that we have about things of the world overwhelm us so that we don't grow spiritually? Are we so concerned with earthly matters that the heavenly matters, that the spiritual matters that God is truly after in our lives are left out? Flip with me to Luke chapter 21, right? Because we know that Jesus is coming again. And in light of that view, right, in light of the fact that he's going to return, he tells his disciples something. Luke chapter 21. Right? I want us to see this because we don't know when he's returning. We know that he is. We believe that he is. We trust that he is, right? We, we know that it's going to happen. And he gives a warning out there. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Right? Signs of the end of the age is this whole portion of Scripture. But in verse 34, he says, be careful. Right? Watch out. Right? Be on guard. Be alert. Or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Right? His return is coming, and none of us knows the day or the hour that his return is going to happen. He says, so be careful that you're living your lives, right, and you're not getting caught up in all of this stuff. Be aware that that's what the world is trying to do, right? The enemy is trying to dig its heels, his, his claws into you and get you to worry about all of these things. And he goes, you're going to miss it. It's going to come like a, like a thief in the night. It's going to be a trap, and it's going to come along. It's going to be boom, it's here. And he goes, don't be sidetracked. Don't be caught off guard. Be aware with, where, with what is going on in your time. The reality is, and I know it full well, right? the reality is, is that, you know, none of our families are, are perfect, right? And we're never, you know, our well-being and the well-being of our families is never secure. There's always ups and downs in our real day life. So it makes it very difficult, right, to say, well, I'm never going to be anxious again. My guess is we're not going to get much beyond this afternoon, potentially, and something's going to come up, and you're going to get, you know, or you're going to go to work, and maybe something changes there, or you get a diagnosis from a doctor, and all of a sudden, anxieties come in. Concerns come in. Worry comes in, right? So there's going to be a constant need for us to fight this and to put it off. And I believe anxiety really comes from a root of one or two things. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers, but I think these are the two areas in my own life that I've seen anxiety rise up. And the first one is, is when we're not aware of God's promises or plans for our life. Right? When I'm unaware of what God has planned for my life, when I'm unaware of the promises that are found in Scripture, right? when, I, when I experience something in life, when I'm unaware of those, I start to get anxious. Yeah, because I don't know what God's going to do. What does God have to say about this? What promises does He have? And if I don't know what they are, what else do I have to find peace in? Where do I find my, my, my sense of peace in those situations when it's unknown? 
And so the first case where anxiety rises up a lot is when we don't know those things. We don't know his plans for our life. Right? And, I, and I hope to address that, and I believe we can address that as we start to dig through the word. Right, when we go to the Holy Spirit and go, Holy Spirit, right, I want to know what God has planned for me. I want to understand what his promises are, what he says. Right? What did the finished work of Christ accomplish for me? Help me to understand that more, under, you know, in a deeper way, in a you know, fuller way. And as we find that, it's found out throughout the word of God. As we trust upon the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. And I hope to do that a little bit more this morning as we look at a passage of scripture on worry. And number two, right, the only other way is where we blatantly distrust God. <laughs> right, we lack faith. God, I, you know, I know what you say. I, be, you know, I, I see it written, but I don't believe it. I don't trust it. It's not true. Right? And all of a sudden, worry and anxiety comes in. I know what it says, but I'm going to say to choose to live the opposite way. And that's where the truly sinful part comes in. That I'm choosing to deliberately distrust the one who says what he's going to do. And I think we all do that in different phases of our lives where we show distrust and I go, I know what God says, but yeah, I don't think that's going to happen today. And he goes, would you stop? Will you trust me? Will you allow it to go happen? You know, will allow you to walk through this path? Both of them really find the fact, they really reveal the fact of where our heart and our trust lies. Right? Whichever one it is, right, whether anxiety or worrying, right, whether it comes from under, misunderstanding or it becomes from a blatant distrust, a blatant disregard for the things that you know, right? they come from the fact that you're not rooted in God's kingdom in that specific area of your life. If there's an area of your life that you have not submitted and understood in light of God's kingdom and the change that he's taken place, the transformation that he's doing in your life, and instead we're captivated, we're, we're entangled in, we're, we're trapped by those things that are more important to us, a steady income. God, you want me to leave this job to pursue ministry. Right? I, I, I did think of my own life in that day, and it took me a long time to tell my wife that we needed to do some things. Way back when we first started coming into the ministry and felt the calling to go into ministry. Right? I had a great job. I had good income. I had a retirement account. I had you know, four weeks of vacation. I had it all in some regards from that perspective. We had our hobby farm. It was all set up. And then you hear the Lord go, God, John, you know what? Look at that parable of the rich young ruler. Sell it all. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. I, and I can't tell you the amount of anxiety and, and worry and fear that you know, was rising up on me that I was dealing with in my own life. And I'm like, God, there's no way. I can't do those things. You know, my, my, I, who's gonna, you know, where am I going to find income from? How am I going to pay for my house? Right? What am I going to do with kids? Right? I know we want to have more kids. How do we provide for kids? What do I do with those? And I mean, it was nonstop. And it was brought back to a spot of, are you going to believe me? Are you going to trust me? Or are you not? Right? And so I live by that principle still today as best as I can. And when I put in that p- point of decision, when I put in a spot where I have to, you know, to trust God or not trust God, that's really my only two options, is obedience or disobedience. And it's the same for you. But when I put in those spots of unknowing, when God speaks to you and says, I want you to do something, right? are we willing to follow him or not? If my need for income, if my need for good health, if your need for well-being, if your need for security and protection is, is greater than your desire for the things of God, you're going to walk in anxiety and fear. But you're going to choose down that path because you go, you know, I don't really trust God that you'll provide for me. And that's a dangerous spot, and it's a growing spot at the same time. Right? It doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're unrecoverable. It means that there's an area to grow in your life. And allow him to work through that. So where I want us to focus the rest of the morning on is back in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up. Matthew chapter 6. And it's a whole portion of the Sermon on the Mount that talks about worry. It's a whole portion that lays it out pretty clearly, right, in very worldly, practical senses that God goes, you know, if I'm going to do these things, won't I do these things also? Matthew chapter 6. Verses 25 through 34. You could take Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34, and you'd find almost the identical verbatim things. There's, there's a couple things different, but not much. It, but it's at a different time. This is the Sermon on the Mount, right? He's up there. But in Luke's version, it's said again in a different setting with different people. And he's saying the exact same thing again. So I think we need to understand it, right? It was listed multiple times for a reason. 
It wasn't just a retelling of, of Jesus' time on the Sermon on the Mount. It was a whole different teaching time. But Matthew chapter 6, let's go ahead and read it together. Starting in verse 25, therefore. And I think that therefore, go back again. Why is it there? Go back up to 24. Right, here's why it's there. No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, right? Jesus goes, since that's true, because that's real, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. So if that is how God clothes the grasses of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Do, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, the kingdom, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What a, what, a, what a chunk of scripture about don't worry, right? He goes, there's all of these things that we worry about. He goes, don't do it. Don't fret over those things. I know you need them. And I'm a heavenly father, right? He, need, he knows you need them. Do we trust that he's that good father that's going to provide them? That's really the question. And when you look at verse 25, he says, do not worry. And then repeatedly he says that throughout this portion of Scripture. That means, really, you could translate that as stop it. Stop worrying. Right, a direct command, stop doing it. Don't do it any longer. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Don't be fearful. Stop it. Right, that makes it a little harsh, maybe. Maybe you're sitting here going, well, that's really just, you know, maybe you've been told, well, that's the way I'm wired. I'm, I'm just an anxious person. That's not true. And I'm not saying that you're not an anxious person, but that's not who you are. That doesn't define you. It doesn't need to define you. Because if it was, if that's just how God made you, it'd be pretty cruel for Jesus to go stop it when you couldn't. Right? That, so obviously we, don't have, we have, obviously we have the ability to not be anxious. Is it difficult all the time? Sure. Has life circumstances driven it into your heart and into your mind and into your lifestyle that you need to be anxious? There's some of us who have, and I don't mean to downplay that at all. But I think there's people who out there who have you know, been diagnosed with anxiety disorders and things, and, I, and, I, and, and my heart breaks for you that those things have been so wound around you that the enemy has gotten such a hold in your life. Right? And the world says, oh, you'll, that, that's just the way you're always going to be. And I just want you to know here this morning that that is not your life sentence. Right? If that's you, if, if you're... If you're an anxious person, right, that doesn't have to define you any longer. Right? God can bring you through that. Is it going to take time? Probably. Is it going to be an instant fix? It could be. Right? Our God has the ability to deliver us from that stronghold should he desire. But in the, point, in the meantime, he's willing to walk you through it if you'll let him. Right? I don't mean to downplay it at all. But I definitely don't want you to think it's a life sentence. Right? God did not make you that way. Right? He, he wants to see you set free. He says to don't do it, so he's going to give you the strength to overcome it if you'll want to, if you'll pursue that with him. Right? Anybody who tells you that you are, the world, the thoughts in your mind that go this is right, that's coming from the enemy. The enemy would love nothing more than to get you wrapped up and distracted with the things of this world. He would love nothing more than that. He would love nothing more for than you for you to believe that your father doesn't love you, that he doesn't care for you, that he can't provide what you need, all of those things, he'd love nothing more than to keep you wrapped up in that. Why? Because the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he knows that if he can keep you sidetracked 
and not trusting God, right? If it can keep us going down this path of unbelief, he's winning in different spots of your life. And hopefully that will start to see and the Spirit will set you free from that. But I want to encourage you, like every other sin that we're looking at, right? We can overcome them with the help of the Holy Spirit. We can be set free from it. Right? We don't have to live in constant fear and in worry and anxiety. That isn't the life of abundance that God, is, that Jesus died that we might have. Right? He died for us to have an abundant life, and that's not it. Right? Do we need to acknowledge it first? Absolutely. Do we need to own it? Yes. But at the same time, I encourage you to take steps. And so let's continue looking at some of the promises here as we go through this portion. Right? So we looked at 25. Now let's get verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. Right? We have a lot of birds that now came back. Right? You see robins flying around, signs of spring, all that kind of stuff. Right? He goes, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Think about that, right? He's, he's, he's sitting there and he's telling them this thing and he looks at the birds and, and, and he, he says, look at the birds. They don't do anything. They don't sow food. They don't go to work, right? They don't reap a harvest. They don't put it away in barns. They don't, they, and yet your father feeds them. He knows they need it. He's created these birds to display his majesty, to display his creativeness, to display his glory, and yet, he feeds them without them doing anything. Don't you think he'll feed you too? Do you not think you're as more valuable than birds? Do you think God has a bigger plan for your life than he has for birds? Hopefully you believe that he does, right? I never have yet seen a bird out there worrying. Now, does that mean that we don't go out and be diligent? No. Right? The birds still work. They fly around. They gather, you know, they eat and do different things, right? They're out doing stuff. It's not like they sit on a tree branch and God just keeps dropping food in their mouths. That doesn't happen. Right? It's the same with us, right? We need to be diligent. We need to be, you know, we need to be doing our part down that path. But should you be in a spot where you're laid up and you go, well, I don't know where my next meal's going to come from. God's able to take care of that. And there's stories galore out there about how that happens. I was just just as I was just speaking, I was thinking about George Mueller and how he was sitting there taking in one of his orphanages and he had, you know, kids galore lined up and he's sitting there and he had no food. And he had no money to buy food and he's sitting there and he's looking at his wife and he's going, God, I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to do. And so they're praying and he's like, I just, you know, God, I, I, I'm trying to trust and I'm trying not to be anxious type of thing. And what happens? A milk truck breaks down in front of his house. And he goes, uh, I got to get rid of this stuff. And lo and behold, the orphanage was provided for. And there's many other stories of that throughout different people's lives, whether you look at missionaries' lives or just everyday Christian lives, right? It happens. We look back and we go, God shows up in a situation when there was no way otherwise. He's got the ability. He says he'll provide for you, right? He knows you need food, so I'm going to give you food. He's not going to leave you starve. It might not be the food you want, <laughs> right? There's a difference, right? Well, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to eat just rice and beans. Well, guess what? That might be what you have to eat because that's what he provides. Is that okay? He does not say he'll supply our wants. He says he'll supply all of our needs through the riches in Christ Jesus. And so there's the first part, right? Where he provides food for us no matter what happens. Right? He says you're more important than birds. Right? Life is more important than food if you were to look at it that way. Who of you, be, you know, life is more important, right? So, how much of you are spending your life worried about what your next meal is coming in? Probably not many of us in our world. There's people all over in Africa that are definitely concerned down that path. Right? They're worried about where the next meal comes from. He goes, but I have a bigger plan and a bigger purpose for you, so for that purpose to be fulfilled, you need food. I'll feed you. I've got it covered. Look at verse 27. I think this one is a big one this week, you know, for me, as I was going through this week, and I was brought to a statement that was, you know, but that's been thrown on the TV screens all over the place. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And I sat there and I listened to 
doesn't matter who it is, right, whether it's our governor and other different leaders around or different people on Facebook or whatever, right, we're out there and we're doing all these things in our society today to save lives. Right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cautious. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be smart. Right? But we're not saving lives. Right? God is the one who gets to say when somebody lives and when somebody dies. We need to remember that. Right? Now, all the things that we're sitting here going, well, I'm going to save my life, I'm going to put my mask on, I'm going to wash my hands, I'm going to do all these things because I'm going to live longer. No. I'm sorry. Right? It says in Scripture that He has preordained all of our days. Right? So there's a day coming when we're going to die, and He knows that day. And if it's not today, <laughs> you're not going to die. If it is today, no matter what you do to protect yourself from the current virus that's going on out there, you're still going to die. He's in control of that. And so he's asking us, right, and he's encouraging, the, and he's uh, encouraging his listeners, right, who of you by worrying can add anything to your life? None of us. Right, so let's not worry too much about making sure that we live all these days and do all these things. Right? Be diligent, be wise, be healthy, do the things that we can do, but don't think that we're in control, that it depends upon us. Whether I live or die depends upon me. It's not true. That's a burden that, not, that I definitely don't want on my own life. I'm going to choose whether I live or die. And I'm going to choose when I... No! That's a burden that I, that I can't carry. It's a burden I wouldn't want to carry. Right? I need to trust that God has a plan and a purpose and a day when that's going to happen. And I need to believe that that's true. I need to live my life as though that's true because it gives me peace and joy in the meantime. Right? Not a one of us can add anything to our lives by worry. Continues on, verses 28 through 30. And why do you worry about clothes? How many worry about clothes? <laughs> Again, probably not many of us other than what to wear. Right? Do I wear this one or do I wear that one? Do I wear the blue one or do I wear the red one? Do I, that's the kind of worry we have. It isn't even so much about having actual clothes to wear, right? Because we have ample. Our closets are full. Our dresses are overflowing in most cases, right? So we're not worried about specific clothes to wear. He says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And he, and he takes the comparison again, and he looks at the field, and he says, look at the lily, and look at how it's dressed. Look at how it's been made. And I've gone into all these details to display my splendor. And he goes, Solomon, who was the richest man on the earth, right, at the time, wisest man, he had all of these things at his disposal. He goes, you could take his finest clothes, and it doesn't even compare. It doesn't compare to how our heavenly Father has dressed the fields with the lilies. It's not even close. And so again, he goes, why are we worried about these earthly things? Right? I've got it. I know you got I know you need them. I'll take care of it for you. Right? Consider the lilies of the field. Continues on. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Again, he has a plan and a purpose for those of us who are following after Christ. And he wants to see that purpose fulfilled. He'll, he will see that purpose fulfilled. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Your purpose in life that God has created and set aside for you to have will be fulfilled. And whatever you need to fulfill that, he will provide. doesn't matter what that is. Whether it's food, whether it's clothing, whether it's resources, it doesn't matter to him. He will provide all of it if we'll continue to follow and trust him. And then he brings it back to the, to the real world, right, again. He brings it back to those who are not following Christ. Verse 31 and 32. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Hmm. He's talking to his disciples. He's telling them, don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you'll drink. Don't worry about what you'll wear, Right? The pagans waste time doing that. Unbelievers waste time doing those things. He goes, don't do it. Don't spend your time down those paths. Hmm. Continues on. Ye of little faith. How 
does that describe you and me? And I, I sit there and I let that evaluate and sink into my own life. And I sit there and go, hmm, am I just like a pagan running after them? Am I, am I so concerned with all of the things of this world that it's choking out the things that God really wants to do with my life? Is it slowly choking out the plans that he has for you and me? Right? That word of the, of the pagans pursue these things means that it strongly pursues. It means they put maximum effort. Right? And you look at so much of our world, it's a dog-eat-dog world. It's, it's those that are looking for the next paycheck, the more money, the more food, the better clothes, the better cars, the better. And that's their pursuit. And God goes, that shouldn't be the pursuit of my people. Not that those things are necessarily wrong, but if that's the driving force of your life, right, that's a dangerous spot to be. And when I look at my own life, when I sense anxiety or worry creeping into my own heart and mind, right, this is exactly what has happened. My focus has shifted. My focus has shifted to, do I have enough money? My focus has shifted, what will I do in retirement? My focus has shifted, do I have enough food? My, and it, it starts to shift and it starts to pull away. And the, the, the scary part about that, right, is it continues to bring in other parts of our lives if we're not careful. It starts off with just, you know what, God, maybe he doesn't provide enough money. And then the enemy comes in and goes, well, if he's not providing you that, will he provide this? And I go, well, yeah, maybe you're right. You know, maybe God isn't sufficient. Maybe he's not good enough. Maybe, yeah, you're right. I know, I, I think that's right too. I'm going to worry about that now. And he goes, ah, good. Well, now I've got two things that you're worried about. And then he adds and he adds and he adds. And before we know it, we're getting, you know, overloaded with anxiety and worry. That I forget that God knows that I need them. And that he promises to take care of me and my family. He promises to meet all of my needs. And I, I, and I lose focus of that. And before I know it, I lose my peace. I lose my joy. I, and my life begins to tailspin in despair. I sit and I go, man, oh man, my life is falling apart. I don't think I'm going to get anything. And it just continues to spiral. And it isn't until the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of me. It isn't until I remind myself, as we sang about in that song, right? I remind myself. It isn't until a brother or sister comes along and goes, hey, that's not true. Stop it. Right, look at all the things that God has provided you. Look at for the times he's broken. Look at the times that he's done the things that he said he was going to do. Go back to those things. Remind yourself. And so if he did it then, will he not still do it today? And I have to be able to answer and go, yeah, you know what? If he did it then, why won't he do it today? Of course he can. He promises me he will. I've lost focus. And maybe that's you this morning as well. Maybe you've lost focus. Maybe you've allowed things of this world to take away your peace and your joy your contentment in the things of God. Right, so there's a question that I want to ask you. Right? What are you worried about? What are you worried about? What are you, ever, what are you afraid of? Right? Your father knows that you need it all, and it's available from him. Worry is not needed if God is your father. Right? It's not. He promises that he'll, he'll meet you in those spots. He'll provide according to his will. And if we believe that he cares for us, if we believe that he's a loving Heavenly Father, right, we can be assured that he'll follow through on what he says. We can be assured of it. But the question is, is how do you tap into that? How do, we, how do we know that that's true? How do we see that that happens? Jesus continues in verse 33. How can I be assured I'm going to get all this that my Father has for me? If you slide into verse 33, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Right? I'll provide you your food. I'll provide you your clothing. I'll provide you these things. Right? I have all of these promises for you. But right, those promises are for those who seek first the kingdom. Those promises are those who put their trust in Christ. Those are not promises made to an unbeliever. They're available should they turn. But if you want to continue to walk in your life and live apart from God and you don't want to trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, those promises don't hold. He goes, you might not have food. You might not have clothing. 
Right? I'm, not ob- I'm not obligated to you. That's a scary thought when we think about it. Right? He goes, if you want to have all these things added to you, if you want to find, you know, though you don't have to be anxious about them, he goes, seek first this, his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So how many of us want to have food? Probably all of us, right? Clothing, drink, want to live a full life? Doesn't matter, right? Take those picks, right? Go down through that path. You want to be free from worry? You want to be free from anxiety? You want to be free from fear? You want to be free from ungodliness, right? You want to be... All those things are available to us. He goes, but don't focus on those things. Don't seek those. Seek me. Seek my kingdom. And all those other things, all those secondary things will be added to you. I'll take care of giving you those things. So instead of worrying about your bank account, right? and maybe some of us are in these days, and if that's you, right, I encourage you to be honest with it. right? Own it. God, I'm worried about it. I don't know what. I, got, I had up this huge amount in the stock markets, and the stock markets crashed, and I don't know what I'm going to do about them anymore. Own it, if that's you. But he goes, don't worry about it. I've got it. Right? Don't focus on any of those things. Instead of worrying about your length of life, right? I'm going to do all these things because then I'm going to live till I'm 90. Lord willing, you'll live till you're 90. <laughs> right? You might not. Right? There's lots of people who don't live till they're 90. God says that's not their plan. I had a lifespan for you. That wasn't your plan. It was his. Instead of worrying about your food and your clothes and all of those things, right? focus on the things of his kingdom. Grow there. Right? Seek him. Right? Spend time with him. Stay still. Look at him. Spend time with him. Grow in that relationship. He goes, and I'll take care of the rest. That doesn't mean you're going to sit there and be lazy and fat, dumb, and happy and do nothing. That's not what I'm saying. Right? You'll still have to work. But God's going to provide to you through his work, right? Through your work. And should you end up getting laid off, or should you lose your job, or should you whatever, he goes, I'll still provide for you. Just through a different means. Right? He owns everything. So don't think that you're providing for yourself through your job. He goes, I've given you the ability to work. I've provided this job opportunity to provide for you what you need. God is still that source of provision in those situations. He goes, so just look at me and allow that to happen. Let the focus of your life be worship and service and the proclamation of Christ. That's what he's asking of us. That is the plan and purpose, right, is that every one of us would be conformed to the image of Christ, right, and that we would make much of him and make, you know, make his word known and make his kingdom known. And he goes, if you're focused on doing those things, I'm going to make sure that you can continue to do those things. I'm going to make it possible that you can continue to do those things. Flip with me to Colossians chapter 3. We went through this not very long ago, so maybe this is pretty, pretty fresh in your mind. Colossians chapter 3. When we set our things, our, when I set our minds on earthly things, we have problems. Colossians chapter three, Paul says, "Since then you have been raised with Christ." Verse one: Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, and not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Right? Since you have been raised with Christ. Go back to, you know, the Matthews, right? He's talking to his disciples. He goes, since this is true, right? Set your heart on things above. Look to the heavenly things. Look to the godly things. Look to my kingdom. Quit focusing on all the things of the flesh. Stop seeking the things down here. And then slide backwards a book. Go to Philippians, right? I just want to run through these real quick. Philippians chapter 4. Right? Again, we're going to hear, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Right? When you begin to worry about the physical problems of life, when you begin to worry about the things of the flesh, 
Right? It's in those moments that you need to stop and you need to bring your petitions to God. Right? He wants you to. He desires for you to bring those things to Him and to spend time with Him and involve Him in those concerns, involve Him in those worries, involve Him in those anxieties. Let Him speak to them so that He can take them away, that He can show Himself faithful, that He can show Himself as that good Father. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on Him. Cast it all. No matter what anxiety you have, no matter what worries you have, he says, cast them all on Him because He cares for you. Jesus cares for you. Our Heavenly Father cares for you. Cast it all upon Him because He's concerned for you. I know we're getting close to a close here. Um, It has been said that worry is not needed. I love this quote. If you're worrying about matters of the past, those are already past and you can do nothing to change them. If you're worrying about matters of the future, we don't even know what what will happen tomorrow. And if we're worrying about the present, this is unproductive. If we can do something to change the situation, let us do so, along with prayer. If we can't change the situation, let us trust in God to work in and through it for our benefit and the benefit of others. In all situations, trust Him. And I've got a list of other scriptures. I'll, maybe I'll email it out because I know we're getting close to time as far as our camera's concerned. Um, it's getting a long, long time here, but I'll send out this list of the Psalms. Repeatedly throughout the Psalms, it's spoken again and again and again and again and again about those who trust in God and how he provides for them. This isn't a New Testament thing. This was, was known to the people of the past in the Old Testament times as well. Will we trust in him is the question. Or will we allow ourselves to be caught up and anxious about the things of the world? If that's, what you're, if that's where you're at, right, I want to encourage you to flee from that sin turn your life back around, to to stop and go, God, I want to trust you. I want to believe that you're in control. I want to to know that you're my provider. I want to trust you as my heavenly father and allow him to show himself faithful as he continues to stretch and grow your faith. Let's go ahead and close out in prayer. Father, I pray that as we continue through this study on respectable sins, God, that you would help us and you would strengthen us to endure God, that as all these things of the world are are, are piling up on us, bringing anxiety and worry and fear, God, that you would help us to put them away, that you would help us to cast them upon you, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you will provide all that we need. You are our loving Heavenly Father who has given up everything that we could be in relationship with you again. Let us trust that you will continue to provide all that we need. Let us cast anxieties and fears upon you as as we become aware of them. Let us deal with them. Let us be honest with them, God, that we could have peace and joy once again. Would you lead us down this path? Would you set us free from worry? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week.